Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Helen. And this is the Squiggly Careers Podcast, where every week we talk to you about some ideas and some tools that we just hope will help you, and they do always help us, to navigate all of our squiggly careers with that bit more confidence and control. And we have spent some time beyond just the conversation we're having with you today, creating lots of resources to help you dive a bit deeper into the stuff that we cover on the podcast. So whether you like some extra reflection and you might benefit from downloading our pod sheet or whether you're kind of a speedy learner and you'd like to swipe through a pod note or whether you want to talk to some other people about this stuff, we've got Pod Plus. All of those things are created for you and they are all free to help you learn and support you with your career. And you can get all the information for them either on our website, amazingif.com or on the show notes mainly on apple i think it's easy to find it and if you ever can't find it just email us we're helen and sarah at squigglycareers.com so today we're going to be talking about how to de-risk career decisions who knew that was something that we needed to learn how to do but as we've dived into this we have decided it is quite useful and there's some good ideas for action that we're going to share with you And the reason that we thought this might be helpful as a topic for today's conversation is, firstly, we know that in squiggly careers, we are making more decisions. There are more choices coming our way. Some of those things are, you know, things that are in our control, but we're perhaps trying to decide which is the right possibility or option or opportunity to explore. And sometimes those decisions are out of our control. So we're sort of almost put on the spot to go, right, okay, well, what is the right thing to do? And when we're considering decisions to make in our career, I think risks can become a reason not to make a change. And when those risks get in our way, it means that we can become frustrated, perhaps we stall, we feel stuck. Maybe we don't make progress towards our potential. I almost feel like we don't then make the most of our squiggly careers if we don't understand our own risk profile, but also if we don't understand what we can do to sort of mitigate those risks, we might sort of leave things that could be available to us that actually we might really enjoy or that could be really exciting or really interesting. And what we're not saying is, oh, you know, we should all be really hedonistic (laughs) after today. Um, You know, just go wild and just do whatever you want to do. As I hope you would all expect, listeners who come back week after week, we're going to be very practical and pragmatic about these career decisions and how you look at these risks and equally what to do if things go wrong as well. You've got me thinking though now, Sarah, about a wild week at work. Other than the alliteration <laughs> of that, I'm like, well, what would I do if I could go wild for a week at work? What would that look like? I might, I might ponder on that after today. But slightly less wild, we thought there might be some common career decisions that might be likely to feel like a bit of a risk, the sort of territory we're talking about today. For example, maybe you're moving from being employed to a career decision that might be about becoming self-employed. Sarah and I have both done that, and that does feel like a really risky thing if you've only ever worked in that kind of like employed and salaried kind of status it might be changing sort of the working week for you so maybe you're moving from full-time to part-time that can feel like a risk on on lots of levels even the conversation to just talk about that can feel like a risk sometimes moving from one industry to another So maybe you're moving from a highly commercial industry to maybe you're working in the not-for-profit sector, something like that. That kind of shift in industry can feel like a bit of a career risk. Or maybe it's from uh, one area of expertise to another, like a professional career change. For example, maybe you're moving from procurement to sales or something like that. Those sort of moves that we make that don't feel like an everyday thing, it's a bigger decision, and that feeling of risk can get in the way of doing it for your development. And when Sarah and I were thinking about risk and trying to zoom out a little bit and like, well, why is it a risk? What are we actually worried about? When we sort of unpacked that word, there's quite a lot behind why you might feel that this particular career decision has a lot of risk involved in it. And so we have identified six factors. Let us know if there are more. If you're like, you still haven't talked about this issue, Um, let us know. But we've got six. So the first risk that we thought impacts your decision is enjoyment. So you might be thinking, but what if I don't enjoy it? What if I decide to do that thing and then I don't enjoy it? The second one could be something to do with your capability. So what if I'm not good at it? The third one could be progression. But what if I do it? Does my career go backwards? The fourth one might be about money. So will I have enough money if I do this thing? 
The fifth is about status. And you might not, like, you might be thinking lots of, that's kind of ego is tied to this one and not a lot of people are very good at this, admitting it. But it might sound like, what will other th- people think of me? Or one of mine in the past was like, who am I if I don't do this? There was definitely more of a sort of an identity fear involved in it. And the last risk could be about relationships. Will people still want to stay connected with me? Will people still want to support me if I make this squiggly career decision? So it might be worth you thinking about those six factors and we'll put them in the pod sheet if it helps you to reflect on them in your own time. But just which is the risk that impacts your career decision making the most? Yeah, and I wonder if we have some risks that stay with us almost regardless of a career decision and some that end up being specific to the type of decision that you're making. Mm. I also think it's helpful when I was going back over career decisions I've made to almost map, well, what are those risks? Because when I was looking at it, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. When I move from being employed to working in Amazing If for the first time, every single one of those risks, so all six of those risks felt really real for me. So that's really kind of high risk and it's worth acknowledging that and sort of understanding that because that'll perhaps feel very different if you've got all six of those things sort of in play all at once. That's a lot to kind of overcome. That will probably feel hard and particularly scary. I think when I first moved from working full time to part time, it was three of them, particularly actually progression and status. So I think I was worried I was you know, will I still be able to progress in my career if I work part-time? And status, I was like, oh, are people going to be judging me, you know, for not working full-time? And I'd got the money one a bit, but I'd practically, I'd figured that one out. It actually felt ironically like less of a risk because almost I couldn't even consider it if I'd not done the money thing. And then when I moved from marketing to corporate responsibility, there were different risks. It was actually enjoyment and capability. So I did have a real sense of I already enjoy what I do. So I'm now moving to an unknown where I don't know if I'm going to enjoy it. And I know that I'm good at what I do today. And I'm now, I don't know if I will be good or not. So again, those two things sort of came together and felt like the main risks. So I think risks do change depending on the context and your the decision you're making. And it's almost just worth thinking about like, what's that risk profile for mm-hmm. any decision? I sort of want to do a drawing, like map your moves and rate your risks. So Mm. for each one of those moves, you're kind of looking at them. I was thinking about some of my moves that I've made that have been riskier career decisions. So probably like industry changey stuff, definitely leaving the corporate life to scaling amazing if was felt like quite a big risk to make. And if I just sort of do a quick risk rating across those moves, I think there was a combination of status, definitely. What will other people think about me? There was a... Mine probably would have been a bit failure, which is, I think, linked to that progression one. But sort of like, uh, but what if ultimately this isn't a good move for me to make? Like, will it look bad on my CV? That was probably what I probably would have thought about. I think I used to be very status and identity anchored to my CV. Like, what does my CV say Mm -hmm. about me? (laughs) Whereas I've sort of gone over that now. And relationships. Like, I love the community I've built around my career. And if I made a decision that would take me away from a particular world of work like marketing for example I probably had a sense of well, well will those people still want to know me because I again and I think a lot I think a lot of it is rooted in identity for me when I just reflect on those different moves and the risks probably yeah being so tied to the work that I do in my identity that most of my risks are associated with that well I guess because you are someone who is very committed to your career and you care about it a lot it's a big part of what you find meaningful and motivating but so you sort of then go oh it then sort of makes sense that then those are the risks you're like well if it's going to jeopardize those things it will always feel harder for you whereas there might be some specific context where that might change or some new ones might come in it's also I was thinking about you know the facts versus feelings thing like when you've got Mm. all this making a career decision could be quite a fact-based thing you know like does it need my skills all that kind of stuff but then what you're introducing is a whole load of feelings and fears and I think that can cloud the clarity of your decision making which also just makes it all feel quite a lot harder so what Sarah and I want to do is I guess decloud is that a word decloud the decision no, for not you? really no. but sure. okay. give you a bit more clarity like maybe just try to 
press pause a little bit on fears and feelings that might be a bit overwhelming and help you depending on which one of those risks that you relate to give you some really useful simple ideas for action that can help you feel a bit more confident about the decision whether the decision is to move forward with that thing or the decision might be to not take it forward you Mm. might decide but it's about I think the confidence in making either of those decisions so for each of the areas we're going to go through the risk the resolution, and what to do if the risk becomes a reality. So as Helen described, you might decide actually that risk is too big, in which case you will feel very differently about making that choice because it's been very conscious. So that's that's good. That's a good thing. Or you might find you do make the move and it doesn't work out. You know, you take that decision and sometimes things don't go the way you'd planned. So I think it's also important to acknowledge that and say, okay, so what might we do in that example as well in that situation so first we're going to take on the risk of enjoyment and capability so we're sort of bringing together those two areas what if I don't enjoy it what if I'm not good at it this is where I think the resolution is as much as possible to look before you leap you know the um sink you know like jump in the deep end type advice I think is really bad advice (laughs) here just like you know just go for it I think there are so many ways now that you can sort of dip your toe in the water if you are thinking about changing industry if you're thinking about going from a really big company to a really small company if you're thinking about going from one area of expertise to another can you volunteer so is there something sort of outside of work that would just get you a bit closer to that decision that you're considering can you go and have curious career conversations with people who are already doing that thing that you think you would like to do can you do a sort of small passion project side project that just starts to get you some experience or sort of again gets you a bit of a insight into what it's really like working in that world can you become part of networks can you become part of communities yes you'll never quite know everything so I think you could almost use this as an excuse to never make a move you know almost be like you could just keep exploring forever and I'm so I'm someone who likes exploring so I can actually imagine myself falling into this trap but I do think you could now particularly with sort of things being more open and more transparent you can start to get a feel for you know whether your skills and strengths will be a good fit whether you think you'll like the working environment whether you think you'll like the people and that can just give you a bit more of a sense of confidence I think in terms of making that decision oh you know I do get the sense actually everyone I've talked to I've got on well with and I think I could learn from I think I'd enjoy spending time with them okay great and I you know I'm a brilliant problem solver and I keep hearing about you know that's what we need we've got a lot of complexity so the people who tend to enjoy being in this industry or this area of the company you know pe- people who really like grappling with interesting problems and and you you sort of know that about yourself and i think it just gives you a bit of the momentum to overcome that risk and do something that will still feel scary i don't think these resolutions stop things feeling scary i think maybe it just gives you the the nudge you need for yourself to go i'm going to be brave Mm. one of the toe dipping things I've done as well which is my I don't know if this is scary or not but going to a conference let's say you're like oh I think maybe I want to work in that area or that industry but it feels a bit scary and that might stop you often most industries have some kind of industry conference that happens and sometimes they're free and sometimes you might have to pay for a ticket or you know work it out but I think when you go for a day and you see the types of people that are there and you see the sorts of things they're presenting and you get a vibe like for example I've worked in the oil and gas industry the technology industry and sort of marketing more broadly in lots of different places and the conferences that I have been to and learning and development conferences very different vibe some of the conversations (laughs) that have gone at those events I've been much more excited about the people have been much more interesting to me I'm not saying that you know just my perspective on it but I've wanted to sit down and have those discussions and there's been just a different energy level and I think that could just give you a window into that world that you're not committing to but you can think oh does this look like something that's going to be a good fit for me and it's yeah very very light touch way of seeing it into it and the one other thing and I guess this relates back to passion side projects and I I know a few people now who are sort of doing this where they're thinking oh there's this thing that I'm interested in but I'm not sure 
if you can partner up with anyone, so if you know anyone else who's sort of thinking along the same lines as you, particularly maybe if you want to start your own thing or maybe you're thinking about doing something different, again, if you can just sort of get something started, you know that point that, you know, no change comes unless you take action. I sort of feel like we can, if you're like me and you're a thinker and you're a reflector, you can get stuck in thinking about, oh, I wonder what it would be like in that area or... Oh, it'd be amazing if I could go and do that but you don't you never sort of do anything about it and I think you know we know change comes from action so anything you can do I think to just move yourself forward and what to do if the risk becomes a reality so let's imagine now you've made the move let's say I've moved from marketing to corporate responsibility and I realize I'm not good at it and I don't enjoy it or maybe one of those but but not the other that will sometimes happen I know quite a lot of people that has happened to you know they've done that sort of risk profiling they've they've made that brave decision and for whatever reason it's not worked out maybe it's not worked out quite quickly or maybe it's been okay for a bit but ultimately it hasn't been the right move for them at that moment it doesn't mean you've made a bad decision and it doesn't mean that you're not sort of self-aware or you've made a really big mistake you can only make choices based on what you know in that moment just sometimes things don't work out in our squiggly careers One of the things that I think can be helpful in that moment is if you've kept your connections from your previous company or area or just previous people who where if, you know, if things aren't going well, you can go back to those people and just see if there are any opportunities, see if other things open up. So many people I see now, the sort of flow of people going in so many different directions. Mm. I see people going back to previous managers, previous companies, going to work on a project basis. And I think that's brilliant because it just means everyone's a bit more kind of fluid in terms of going, oh, well, okay, that that thing didn't work out. But, oh, do you know what? We've got a project. So if you're free, great. Do you want to come do this for six months while you think a bit about what you want to do next? So I think if you are making that move, don't sort of forget those people because those people can then be very helpful just in case, you know, think things don't go as you planned. And also it's really good to stay in touch with those people because you can keep learning from them in a different way. So the second risk that we identified was the one about progression. And so this is the one as a reminder that might sound like, oh, if I do this, could my career go backwards? And that always feels like a funny feeling, doesn't it? The idea of going backwards mm. when we should always I be moving forward. So much. Yeah, I hear this fear too. And so people kind of go, well, I don't want to go backwards. So maybe you don't take this decision forwards. So the resolution here is to think, well, what would be better because... And the point here is to not get so fixated on the role that's in front of you right now. So we might think, oh, but maybe if I take that sideways move, my career might feel like it's going backwards. But actually, if you think beyond just that move and you think a bit further into your future and think, well, how could this move that I might now make help me get closer to what I might want to do in the future it's almost like leapfrogging opportunities rather than just looking sort of at the role in front of you think sort of a couple of roles in front of you that might be interesting to you and think well how would this role get me there because we're not trying to say any one job is perfect no one job is perfect and so if you're thinking about it in a very binary way like good decisions and bad decisions you put quite a lot of pressure on the moves that you make but if you just think well how is the move in front of me going to help me to get for the forward it reminded me when I was thinking about this idea for action it reminded me of my old driving instructor Andy who always had words of wisdom and when I was driving but it's probably because he was quite scared of my driving he always used to say to me (laughs) Helen drive two cars in front drive two cars in front as in don't just look at the brake lights of the car in front of you because if they're having to respond to the car in front of them you're probably going to be too late in terms of your response so it was like drive two cars ahead um (laughs) it's very it's very wise man he also used to say when I was going a bit too fast on the road Helen slow down better to be late in this world than early in the next it was very, full, of, <laughs> full of wisdom Andy but I guess it's just that idea of like what territories are interesting for you and your talents in the future and just depressurize this move that you might make now and just think well how could it help me learn more about that world I'm interested in the future or develop some experience or expertise that might get me closer to it and then it becomes less of a right and wrong move and just something that gets you closer towards what you might want to do in the future yeah when I think about a couple of people who 
I think early on in my career had really recognised that progression was so much more than promotion. And I remember thinking, almost finding it quite hard to understand the decision that they'd made. You know, they were making a sideways move or perhaps didn't accept a promotion that came their way because they were like, oh no, I want to go and learn these other skills or I want to kind of broaden my skills first. I think this will ultimately be a more interesting experience. And I think they were absolutely right because what they had done was sort of spotted oh, well, if I go and get these skills in a couple of years' time, that's going to be so valuable. And maybe I won't be able to get those skills in a couple of years' time. So sort of that will that will help me to be employable. That's going to increase my career resilience. And so I, I think sometimes just kind of letting go of, it is letting go of the ladder. It's also, I think, sometimes letting go of what you think you should be doing mm-hmm. and maybe what other people think you should be doing. So, you know, that, pressure to always move you know like you know onwards and upwards you know that even that even that phrase and you're like well moving onwards doesn't necessarily mean moving upwards it might be just doing things very differently but I think this is a it's a hard one to let go of and it it does take a lot of confidence I think confidence is really kind of intertwined with kind of managing this risk for yourself and then if the risk does become a reality so let's say you you decide to do something that has been a risk in your mind to your progression because you feel like, well, maybe this wasn't the right move to make, then I think the really important thing for you to have in your head is don't feel like you have to stick it out for the sake of your CV. I think a lot of people end up unhappy because they make a move, it isn't quite what they wanted it to be, and then they feel like they have to sit in and stick it out for like 18 months to two years, and they're really unhappy, and they don't make the impact, and they're not you know, positive about the relationships they're building. Or it sort of has so many ripples of impact when you're not happy in your role, and you can move in less than a year and it will not be a disaster for your development. Sarah and I have both done this in our career and you might want to think about the story that you tell to explain making that move sooner than other people might expect you to do. You might want to think about that. But I think you don't have to stick it out. The most important thing is that you are happy and you are learning and if those things are not true, then it is not the right role for you and you should feel positive about finding something different. Yeah, I think when I reflect back on that learning point, that's probably where it gave me the confidence to move on quickly because I've always wanted to feel like I was progressing and learning, like learning is one of my values. And I definitely chose one role at a certain point where it felt like the right thing to do, but very quickly I was like, oh, okay, I'm not going to get to learn what I'd anticipated. And do you know what? That's no one's fault. Mm -hmm. You know, it it wasn't their fault and it wasn't sort of my fault. But it was just a, it was just the kind of the reality of that role. It just wasn't the right fit for me. And I'm sort of so glad that I moved on from that quite quickly. And actually, I moved on from that really positively. So it wasn't like I left feeling like, oh, I feel really bad about myself. And actually, I didn't feel bad about those relationships. I think because quite quickly, I'd been open and honest about oh, sort of I hadn't, you know, I hadn't quite understood the reality of this role. I feel like I'm perhaps not learning the things I thought I was going to be. And, you know, I think, you know, managers and organisations probably feel that too. Mm. And so in some ways it can be quite a relief if you've got supportive people. And I would say I had very supportive people for actually everybody to acknowledge that because then they can also think a bit about, okay, well, if Sarah's not the right fit here, you know, everybody didn't quite, maybe probably you've got to make some adjustments in terms of who that role might be right for so and it gives everyone a bit more time and space to do that in sort of it's very adult to adult isn't it if you can involve people and I do know a couple of other examples of people who sort of have shared stories with me over the past couple of years where they have definitely involved their manager or their mentor or someone within their organization to sort of go ah this sort of progression hasn't quite worked out for me so should we like try almost like should we try and figure this out together rather than it being a shock or sort of leaving it until everyone gets incredibly unhappy yeah and I was just thinking about we do this together with each other and I know that's because we've got a lot of trust but sometimes Sarah and I will unpack our roles with each other and be like what are we really enjoying and what are we not and Mm. that can be really helpful and you probably can't get rid of the stuff that you're not 
enjoying overnight but having that honest conversation and someone else playing back to you and going well okay well that is that is something that needs to be done is it something that needs to be done by someone in your role is it something that someone else can do it's just like a neutral conversation about career development so I think if you are somebody that is supporting someone in their career like you're a manager or a mentor or maybe someone's coming to you you're in a you know an HR position just sort of taking the fear away from the conversation and almost be like okay walk me through a typical week at work what are you really enjoying doing what are you not enjoying enjoying doing and let's see what percentage of time that represents and whether there's something different we can do in the role or whether this isn't the right role for you like i wish we had more of those conversations yeah. and made people feel less bad about it <laughs> that's definitely true so the next risk is money And the resolution here, and I think this is one that I've done a couple of times, more successfully actually in the last couple of years, is being really clear on your enoughs. I actually call it your enough Excel because let's face it, it sort of has to be an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> there's sort of there's sort of no getting away from that, I, d- I don't think. There's probably more sophisticated solutions, but if you're sort of a bit more basic like me, it probably has to be your enough Excel. And I think this is being very open and kind of transparent to really looking at what does your enough look like when it comes to the cash that you need and I think we might have talked about this on the money podcast maybe even last summer I've definitely used a kind of zero-based budgeting approach to thinking about this and zero-based budgeting is something some people listening to it will be like sounds fun Sarah (laughs) I mean it really is but some people listening perhaps have done it in their organizations and they're probably like getting really tense just uh, listening to us talk about it but in a more fun way the idea here is that you start from scratch so rather than just sort of maybe I don't know looking at your bank account and kind of using all of those numbers you actually go right starting from zero what are my musts in terms of I have very little option in terms of you know needing enough money to do those things so those things are like your bills which you know for most people are probably a bit higher now than they were unfortunately those things like your rent or your mortgage your childcare those things we like they are very difficult to to really change and then also thinking about okay beyond that what does enough look and feel like for you because I'm not a big fan of, you know, when you read those articles and everyone's like, well, just cut out your coffees and just cut out all of the small stuff that basically brings you joy in your life. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't, I, I personally, I'm not sure how that would make me feel in terms of, oh, I've got some sort of job that then means I can't buy myself a coffee. Um, I, that wouldn't quite work for me. Maybe that does work for some people. But I think you do want to have this kind of sense of, like what's most important to you. Maybe for you, you're enough. Maybe you, maybe you don't need the expensive coffee, but maybe you do really need your gym membership because you're like, you'd love to feel fit and that's actually really important to you. And very rarely have we kind of really actually thought about like what that number needs to be. And I then think having that parameters, those parameters sort of in mind in terms of going, right, well, I now know from my enough Excel what my minimum is. Now, I would not advise using that minimum, obviously, as a starting point for then negotiating pay or thinking about roles. But you sort of do have that sense of, right, I know that anything below that is is just unacceptable. It'll be really stressful for you. It will sort of end up kind of dominating your days. And so having those, those numbers, having that clarity, not sort of hoping. If you're someone who's like me and I sort of get a bit I avoid numbers stuff sometimes or I just sort of hope for the best as well you know like it'll probably all be fine and I think if you're making quite a big career decision or choice or change this is not something you want to leave to chance you want to approach these decisions and kind of manage this risk with you know back to Helen's point about facts versus feelings this is the one where I'm like this is all about the facts. This is not about how you feel about money. And I think actually we have a lot of emotions, don't we, to do with like Mm -hmm. money and our risk profile to do with money is actually more about probably us and how we grew up and how we view money. But really try and get to the facts about like, right, what are my options? What are my parameters? And then it can give you confidence because sometimes, you know, you might be pleasantly surprised or you might just, it might help you to take stuff off the table where you're like, well, okay, at some point, maybe I would like to work a three-day week, but actually just at the moment, that's not going to be an option for me or that's not an option until I get more free childcare hours or whatever whatever it might be. And just sort of knowing that I think then can just help you go, well, what decisions do I have available to me? The other thing that I think has helped me with 
where money has been part of the decision making process for me and it's felt a bit scary has been to talk about it with other people because mm. I think you make because money does often feel a bit scary you make a lot of assumptions oh I can and can't do this and this is and isn't possible and then you talk to somebody else and they'll be like well why don't you just try this or have you thought about this yeah because and, and then you're, it suddenly sort of unlocks I think we get locked in really quickly to our thinking about money and moves and I've had so many examples like when I was thinking about what I wanted to do at Microsoft and Virgin actually where both my managers it was Scott at Microsoft and James at Virgin they both unlocked my thinking about what was possible with my salary and the role I was doing and it then just made me feel a bit more confident about having those conversations because I was like oh yeah I hadn't thought about it like that and so I would think who can you talk to and start with someone that you trust and it feels a bit easier first particularly if you're kind of a bit more nervous talking about money and then go to somebody who can influence the outcome and just have an open conversation with them about your your thoughts and ideas on it and just see whether they've got anything to add to it you're not saying oh can you solve this for me or what answers have you got I think it's more have you got a perspective on this or is there anything that you would add to inform my thinking it's that sort of an open conversation yeah and I think because especially in Britain I think people are sort of almost a bit sensitive about talking about money but to your point Helen I think when I've had those conversations before what people give you are examples they're like oh well I tried this or I did this or have you thought about that and you'll think well no I hadn't or I just didn't know that was a I just didn't know that was a possibility and so that can just it can just um broaden your horizons I think in terms of what might be possible and what to do if that risk becomes a reality so let's imagine you've done all this great stuff and you've made a decision maybe you've gone to work part-time so then you are earning less money for most people that would mean you're earning less money depending on how you do that or maybe you'd move from the commercial sector to charity sector would probably mean you might be your salary might be at a lower level not necessarily but you know the salaries don't tend to be as competitive in the charity sector and then you're in that job and then you're thinking oh uh, I didn't calculate this in the right way maybe you haven't got enough money or it's just been more stressful than you thought it might be and so you sort of feel like okay this is not gonna work for me and maybe like unexpected extra costs have come your way that do mean you sort of need to almost like row back on that career decision I think at that point, and I have done this every time, I have made probably a really big career decision. If you can have even a small rainy day fund, I think it can just give you that bit of breathing space that you need in an emergency. And I know that that is much easier to say than it is to do because that means you've got to sort of save up a bit. But I always use the equivalent of thinking three months salary. Now, three months salary is not it's not really that long, but I always felt like three months was better than no months. And six months was always my ambition. I was like, right, if I could have three months salary just sitting there, but six months in my dream scenario, it does mean that if something goes dramatically wrong or I just really need to walk away from something or something becomes really toxic, I can just do that. It's still going to be a really kind of challenging time but at least I've sort of bought myself a bit of time to then, you know, go back and talk to those connections, maybe get a project, think about what I could do kind of freelance. And this might sound like um, not what you'd expect to hear at Harvard, but I do really remember going to Harvard to do a leadership program and they talked about having a fuck it fund. So I'm like, well, if it's good enough for Harvard, it's uh, good enough for all of us. (laughs) I love it. I was also thinking, (laughs) and this is a very Helen, this is a very Helen thing, but I think when I've made career decisions, like, so literally, like, moving from Microsoft to Amazing Gift, initially, like, I'm more than halved my salary. And so there are lots of things that I had to cut back on in order to make that move. And, and you know, we sort of put enough money into our business that I had this, like, runway for, like, six to nine months to, to that I knew that. But it was still half my salary. And there are things that I like spending money on that are sort of part of my identity. Like, you know, like Ooh. I love I love food and I love shopping. And I knew that that wasn't, that wasn't part of, you know, I didn't have the spends to do that. So I instead, um, and that is quite a big part of me. So I kind of moved to like selling things. I sort of had my like, I did have like a circular. Oh, I really remember this. I loved Your it, circular would, economy. Yeah, like I had my little circular fashion economy where I'd be like, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll sell that bit for my wardrobe and then I'll just reinvest that into a pair of shoes. 
shoes and then I'll send I'll sell that handbag and I'll put that into a whatever and so I still felt like I hadn't lost something that was quite important to me equally I know I'm not like on PR for Oddbox I talk about Oddbox all the time but like I love cooking so I do Oddbox and that means I get like all my fruit and veg a lot cheaper so I don't have to compromise so I I know we, we might be talking about big things like your salary and your rent I get that but I also think some things that you might spend money on might feel like part of your identity and like shopping and cooking is part of mine so I just got a bit more creative with how I could still do some of those things when I didn't have the same kind of funds available to me. Jo, I really remember that time quite vividly because you did get very entrepreneurial (laughs) about your possessions (laughs) in a a way that sort of blew my mind because you and I have actually quite a different approach to money, I would say, and how we sort of manage that those kind of risks but just sort of watching you sort of create your own like right buying and selling the sort of Helen Tupper version of eBay was um, <laughs> was was incredible <laughs> unfortunately I still seem to be doing it Sarah but just with yeah. more, more things now more things now as I said part of my identity but we'll, we'll, we'll move on that before I guilt myself into my uh, my shopping habits so we've got two more to talk through I'll talk about one and say I'll do the last one so one I wanted to talk about was the risk of status. And this again is one I can relate to. So it's where you feel like a decision that you're making might affect what other people think about you, or it might affect your identity. And it's that sort of risk that makes you not make that move, even though it could be good for you. And so our suggested resolution here is to not think about this as like a job or a position, but to give the move a name that's a bit more meaningful. So I might say, oh, this is my international trade tryout or this is a bit of a pilot for a pivot or this is a real profile building position you're almost retaining some identity in the move that you're making which is much bigger than a job title and I think then you have a bit of a a story that you can feel like you own and that you can sell to other people so even when I'll I'll give you an example so when I was at Eon I was head of um I worked in Ignite I was a venture manager for this team called Ignite and people were always really excited about well what's that doing what do you do in innovation and then I moved to a marketing manager for energy and aviation lubricants (laughs) like on the surface it was like (laughs) the glamour uh, the glamour of working in lubricants but for me I didn't really say I didn't really talk about that job title because I thought oh, it's not very like it's not really great for my identity but what I did talk about was it was a global role so I was like oh this is like a really big opportunity for me to have an international position and it was more the meaning behind the move that I attached myself to rather than the job title or the company so I think give the move a name and make that the story that you tell and if you do make the move, let's say you've, you, you you go to that thing and even though you've given it a name, it still feels like you've lost a little bit of your identity. My top tip here would be you can still stay connected to those communities where you recognize your old self in. So for example, I am still very connected to lots of marketing communities because I love that world. I love the people in them and I and I still see a bit of myself in them. I don't need to leave all of that behind. So it's almost this fear that we make that when we make a move, we have to be somebody completely different and operate in a completely different world. And actually, if you can stay connected to the communities, then all you actually do is you build a bigger network around your, your career anyway. But you don't have to lose yourself when you leave a position or a company. I think for me, what's been helpful here, because I I really recognize this one as well, particularly when I left big companies to do our own thing, I sort of still almost find that hard when I'm then surrounded back by people who are still in that world that I was in. And I think that's because the risk almost gets heightened for me by sometimes by comparison. So, you know, sometimes if I'm like catching up with a couple of people and they are sort of where I was, but obviously they've continued to progress and develop and do whatever they now do and I sort of made a different decision but I'm still really good friends and and you know got lots of connections in that kind of previous world I will sometimes miss like you described Helen I'll sort of think oh that was used to be me or I was kind of more like that at one point and the thing that I find really useful if you are a bit prone to comparison from time to time and that's not them making me feel bad that is sort of me comparing myself and and for whatever reason going oh like what, what am I now? Who, like, who am I now? Having basically a bit of an identity crisis is I always just ask myself, what am I proud of? You know, we talk sometimes about this idea of kind of doing a pride postcard to yourself. And if I think about what I'm proud of, 
I want, like sort of what I want to say about myself. It's not the, oh, Sarah is a corporate high flyer. Or it's like, <laughs> my uh, my partner's mum goes, she always like describes, she's like, oh, they're not like you, Sarah. They're not a businesswoman with a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> that's how she describes me I'm like oh I feel like she's she's really committed to the laptop bit it's always like I'm because her, her daughter also runs a very successful business she's like not like you girls with your you're so successful in business with your laptops <laughs> brilliant and I was like probably not really how I see myself now in terms I'm not that proud of my laptop which does seem to overheat on quite a regular basis but I am really proud of the fact that we have created something from scratch I'm really proud of our partnership together I'm really proud of some of the difference that we make in in people's careers the fact that we can support such a wide range of people and so when you ask yourself that pride question I think sometimes it can help you to just let go of a some of your old identity stuff that might not be serving you anymore any status stuff that's getting in your way and also any ego that might creep in from time to time and comparison all of those things which are actually quite (laughs) quite tricky And then lastly, on relationships. So the risk here is you feel like, well, if I go and do something different, are people going to forget about me? Will I feel irrelevant? Will people still want to be friends with me? And the resolution here is to involve the people that you already know in your decision making. And I think both Helen and I have done this a few times when we've been making these decisions and it's felt like it's quite kind of high risk. Sometimes you feel like you shouldn't involve other people because maybe you're talking about doing something quite different. And I remember being quite almost apologetic or a bit embarrassed about talking about some of these things because I was thinking, oh, but these people have really supported me to help me to squiggle to where I am today. And do I look ungrateful? I think that was what was going through my head. I was like, I don't want to look ungrateful because they've really invested in me. And now I'm saying, oh, I think I might go and move from marketing to corporate responsibility. But this marketing manager or this person I work for has sort of been here for me. And I'm like, oh yeah, right. Might just go and do something different. Sorry about that. Or I'm going to go and you know, work in a whole different industry or start on my own thing. But I think what you forget is that if somebody is invested in you, it's you that they are investing in, not your job title or not what you are doing today. And that was really true for me. Like whoever I spoke to in terms of more informal mentors or peers or previous managers, they weren't sort of invested in me as a content person in Sainsbury's or as a CR person in Sainsbury's or whatever job I was doing. It was sort of, it was me and they wanted to see me succeed in my squiggly career. They were really interested in supporting me with what that might look like, asking me some really good questions. And so I think, you know, when we talk about progression, we'll often talk about uh, prototyping your progression and involve, don't solve. Don't feel like you have to kind of solve everything for yourself. Bring the right people into that decision making process because actually they can de-risk it for you. It was definitely people that de-risked the corporate to amazing if decision for me. And I can literally name them. There were Mm. like three, there were three or four conversations I had where people were, usually quite direct, to be honest. They were very good. They were very good at being direct, asked some really brilliant questions. And they were the ones who gave me the kind of nudges to actually go, oh, okay, yes, this feels risky. And as I described, all of those six risks that we talked about at the start of the podcast were all very present for me at that moment. So it felt very, very high risk. And I was really in danger of never quite doing it, never quite making that leap. And it was this that really made the difference. And what to do if the risk does become a reality? So let's imagine now you kind of made a move and you're like, oh, a couple of those relationships, people do seem a bit less interested in me or maybe haven't got time for me now in the way that they did before. I think there is an important point in terms of accepting the sort of investment and the quality of all of your relationships in your career won't stay static. So there will be certain people where at certain moments you might feel like, you're spending a lot of time with them, you're learning a lot from them. And that just might feel less relevant and useful for them and for you, for where you are now. And again, that's definitely been true of me. And sometimes I'm guilty of thinking every relationship should be amazing. (laughs) And I should I should be up to date with everyone. And I should be best friends with everyone all of the time. But I think, you know, like any relationship, it has moments where you're sort of really in it. And some of those people will stay exactly the same because they're just sort of, they're so invested in you and your squiggly career. But there will be certain people, actually a couple of people I think about who really helped me to de-risk that big decision to move across to Amazing If. 
they're not people I talk to now frequently. They're definitely people who I could still get back in touch with, who I would sort of, I might see occasionally at the odd event, or we definitely have some people in common. But it's not like I then sort of spent loads and loads of time with those people after that moment. So I think, again, just not putting that pressure on ourselves to feel like every relationship in terms of our career community has to last forever. Yeah, I agree. I think like redefining that relationship so that it feels Mm. sort of different and new and still useful to you and to them is also an important thing to do. So just to recap then of what you'll get in the pod sheet. So we will cover the six risks that you might find relevant to you and then think about a decision that you might have coming for you in your development, which risk might hold you back from making that decision. And then you can go to the relevant resolution. And we just hope that will just give you that confidence and control. That is all we're ever really looking to do when we do this podcast is give you a bit more confidence and control over the decisions you make with your development. And if you've got questions or feedback for us, you can always get in touch with just Helen and Sarah at squigglycareers.com. So thanks so much for listening. I'm back with you again soon. Bye for now. Bye everyone.